read the, the psalm. It's only five verses, and then we'll get into our study as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study through the psalms. Psalm 15 really gives to us the attributes of a godly person and uh, answers the question concerning who the Lord is going to welcome into heaven. Beginning at verse 1, David, the psalmist, said, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put, put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. And so we have the opportunity in Psalm 15 to see the qualities of somebody who is heaven-bound. It answers the question for us, what kind of person is going to go to heaven? Obviously, we need to remember that the Bible makes it very clear that not everybody ends up in heaven. I've mentioned this to you before, but it's worthy of repetition at this moment. When I first got saved 33 years ago, I would share that I was going to heaven. People would argue and say, you're not good enough to go. Today, everybody basically goes to heaven. But does the Bible teach that? Does the Bible teach that if you try hard or if you're sincere or if you're religious, that you automatically have a free pass to heaven? Well, this particular psalm answers that question for us. The answer to that question is no. There are only certain people who do go to heaven. In the book of Revelation, in Revelation 22, verses 14 and 15, uh, John writes, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Heaven is open to any who would come in, but you need to come in through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible teaches very specifically. And those who have committed their hearts to the Lord have certain characteristics, and that's what David, the psalmist, shares with us in Psalm 15. He speaks to us concerning the person who will be found in heaven. Now notice with me, he says in verse 2, in answer to the question, who may dwell in your holy hill, which is another way of saying who can go home with you or be with you in, in, in heaven. He, he answers the question in verse 2 when he says, he who walks uprightly, works righteousness, speaks the truth in his heart, he who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. So he begins to share with us the kind of person who's going to go into heaven. And the answer is a righteous person, a person who is walking in a blameless fashion. And this is what he's pointing out. When he speaks concerning, and notice with me, the one who walks uprightly, that word uprightly speaks about a person whose life is blameless. In other words, it's a person whose life is marked by integrity. This is the kind of person who lives a moral life. A person who is walking in this way, who walks uprightly, is a person who has a heart that desires to please God. Now, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, says the same thing. He says, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. And so a person who enters into heaven is a person who walks uprightly, a person whose life is marked by integrity. In Colossians 1.10, Paul said, I pray that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So a person who's going to heaven will have a walk that manifests itself with his words as well as his actions. What we have here is a connection that is really made between the way a man thinks and the way a person acts. And he's saying integrity is manifested by an action that is first an attitude. And that's absolutely right. That's why the Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 is so important. Because in that particular scripture, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. If I'm going to go to heaven, then my life is going to be manifesting certain things. The first thing is that I'm going to have a blameless life. I, I didn't say perfect life. I said a blameless one. I will have an attitude, a desire to please God. That's a person who is walking uprightly. 
In verse 2, when he speaks about working righteousness, he's making it very clear that the attitude of integrity and the desire to walk uprightly is going to produce works that are righteous. So my attitude and my actions will always be tied together. And notice what this righteous person is like. And as I look at this, if you take notes, and I want you to see in verse 3, as he begins to share some of the attributes, he doesn't backbite with his tongue, doesn't do evil to his neighbor, does not take up a reproach against his friend. This, is all, this all can be tied in together with, with, with one word. This is a person who loves. This is a person who has the love of God in his heart. Listen, when you have the love of God in your heart, you're not going to backbite. When you have the love of God in your heart, you're not going to be injurious to somebody else. It's that easy. The Lord Jesus Christ taught us something that we need to remember, that I have to constantly remember. And Jesus taught us that if I'm going to be anything like him, then I'm going to have love in my life. He said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So the genuine mark of a person who is upright, the genuine mark of a person who is righteous, isn't the things that he or she necessarily do not do, though that is true, of course. There are certain things we don't do. But there's a reason why we don't do certain things. And the reason why we don't do those things is because we love God and we love our neighbor. And so notice with me as he speaks about this, he doesn't backbite, he doesn't do evil to his neighbor, and he doesn't take up reproach against a friend. When he says he doesn't take up a reproach against his friend, that's because he's loyal. Now, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 16, verse 28, that a perverse man sows strife, a whisperer separates the best of friends. Romans 13, verse 10 says, Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So when you have a right relationship with the Lord and you're walking uprightly, when you're walking righteously, then your life is going to be marked by the love of God. And that's the point that he's making here. In verse 4, when he says, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, that's an interesting way to put it. A vile person is a person who's known for his evil way of life. But there's a word that used to be used as it, that, that describes this vile person, and that word is reprobate. This is a person who desires and knows nothing but evil. That's their way of life. That's their code of conduct. And the Bible tells us in Proverbs 23, verse 17, we're not to let our heart envy sinners, but we are to be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. Proverbs 24, verse 1 says, Don't be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them. The fact is, our desire ought to be honoring those who fear the Lord. Now, I want you to notice that here. When he said in verse 4, In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. I, I was thinking about this today, and, and I was thinking this way. Perhaps this will make it practical for us. And I want you to see that again. He honors those who fear the Lord. One of the ways that we can figure out whether or not we're walking in a righteous fashion is just to ask ourselves a simple question, who is my hero? Who do I look up to? Who do I want to be like? Who do I admire the most? Now, I didn't watch the Super Bowl, but I understand the halftime was interesting. My son David was watching the Super Bowl. Actually, I watched a bit of it. It was, it was a good snooze for the first half, at least. And um, I had gone upstairs to prepare for the evening service when my son David began to yell, and I heard him downstairs, and he was saying, Dad, you got Dad. Dad, come downstairs quickly. So I think there's something bad happening, and there was. So I came running down, and I said, what? And we have that Tebow thing. He said, Dad, I'm not going to tell you. I just want you to see. And I said, oh, okay. You know, and I'd already begun to watch the halftime show. I was really moved by, by Kid Rock and his American flag poncho and all. And um, who'd have thought that he'd be the moral guy in the whole show? But anyway. <laughs> so Dave, you know, and there's this thing with Justin and Janet, you know, and dancing around and all, and I'm thinking, you know, this is kind of odd. Do you mind if I share this with you? No, Pastor, please do, okay? 
And I don't know. I don't think it's because I'm old. I just think it's odd. And I'm not really entertained by a young guy slapping an older woman in the rear end. And so that's what he's doing, right? And she's trying to act like she's 20 years old again. She's 37. That's not old, but to me. Anyway, as she's, <laughs> as she's dancing around like that, and then you got Justin, you know, be looking all big, mean, and tough. And I'm thinking, boy, he's the toughest Disneyland kid I've ever seen. <laughs> he's at least as tough as Goofy. And as he's walking around and doing his strut and his meanness and hitting her, and she's all, oh, you know, I'm thinking, why am I watching this? This is rather dumb. And then the moment comes. <laughs> <laughs> I was shocked. I was shocked. I, he says, did you see that, Dad? And I said, well, how could I help it? I was, I was flabbergasted. I was absolutely amazed that that took place. Not because those kinds of things don't take place in concerts all the time, but because it was allowed to go over the air in such a way with somewhat close to a hundred million people in the United States watching it at the same time with all these people who were having a Super Bowl get together and many of them being Christians with their kids enjoying a football game and making an evening out of it and as I watched that and saw that I was I was shocked but I started thinking about it and immediately you get the you know I'm so sorry. I mean, I heard Janet today saying, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to. If I offended, she's saying, if I offended, you know, thousands of phone calls flooded CBS. And, and to sit down and say, if I've offended, is a, is a rather stupid thing. I mean, you, you obviously did offend. And, and here's part of the problem. There's a reason I'm bringing this up to you, by the way. Some of you might be saying, how come you're telling us this? We already know this because I'm up here and you're down there. <laughs> it's because entertainers, Janet Jackson, Justin, and the rest, are extremely insulated from the real world. They have people who pander to them, telling them that they are the best thing ever. They have groupies that are surrounding them who basically have encouraged them to do whatever they want, whenever they want, in whatever way they want, for as long as they've been an entertainer. In the life of Justin and Janet, that has been going on for the majority of their life. This is obvious. And so when you are ushered in, ushered out, when people want your money so they'll tell you anything you want to hear, and when they protect you and isolate and insulate you, it really breeds in you an inability to understand what an average person really is like. You also have people who are basically hired by you to make you believe that you are beyond the law and beyond all customs and morality. So when you do something in front of people that actually offends them, it surprises you because the people that you hang around with think that that's no big deal. So you bought into a system, into a lie, into a way of life that is really imaginary. It's really one of those great examples of a person who really doesn't have a clue what the average person really is all about. And so with Justin and with Janet, I think that's a great example of what people's heroes are willing to do. They don't understand that they could offend people. Neither one of them really do. They don't understand. CBS, you know, who put on the show, in alignment with MTV, you've got to be kidding me. MTV combined with, with CBS, and CBS is shocked that MTV, a, 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 you know, a television um, programming kind of uh, establishment that that's put, puts on shows like Jackass, and I mean, that surprised CBS. So all of this smacks of such nonsense. And yet, the reason I'm saying this to you is because in a few days, there are going to be the Grammys, I believe it's the Grammys, and Janet and Justin are presenters, and they're going to come out more than likely to a standing ovation, 
and people in their clique are going to be saying to them, what you did was okay. You stretched the envelope a little bit further. And these people don't understand why people who are just average people like you and I, who happen to have morals who are Christians, they cannot understand why you would be so upset over that. Because they have such a group. And perhaps maybe you're not upset over that. I'm upset that children can't watch a football game without having sex thrown in their face. And I also think, though there was a commercial that everybody thought was funny about a horse and a candle and a woman with burned hair, that is, what, you know, that's what is called coarse humor. That was crossing a line that hadn't been crossed. And there are a lot of things that we don't see because we're kind of blind to the culture wars that are going on, guys. We're kind of blind to the fact that CBS, NBC, and ABC say it's okay to use the F word now. We're blind to the fact that you have uh, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy as a hit show. We're blind to the fact that our culture is at war with our Christian principles. We're also blind to the fact that we can be affected by that and actually get to the point where we are desensitized to that and don't even see the problem with it. And there are Christians who will argue saying, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal really is when the church becomes so insensitive to what's going on around it that it doesn't even react anymore to the things that are happening and is an absence of, of indignation. There's an absence of shame. There are quite a number of people today who even 20 years ago wouldn't strut around saying the things that they say and doing the things that they do. 30 years ago, this, much of what you see today wouldn't even have been allowed out. And so what we have right now is we have a culture war. Now, I'm watching, and forgive me, this isn't a political pitch and all. You choose who you think is, is going to be the best president and all. And so forgive me if it sounds like I am switching from one thing to another, because I am. But to take it in a different direction. So you have uh, Democratic right now, because all the primaries are Democratic, so I'll use that as an example. So you have an individual who was a Congressional Medal of Honor winner, who discarded his medals and all, and from being somebody who fought on in the Vietnam War and uh, with valor, you know, turns and says we shouldn't be in it and all of that, who is calling himself a true New England patriot, you know, borrowing from the Patriots' victory just this last week in the Super Bowl. And he says, I'm a New England patriot. But I've been reading concerning the things he believes in. He believes in partial birth abortion. He believes in homosexual marriages. He believes in everything that Jesus taught us, not everything, but he believes in many things that Jesus taught us were absolute sinful and ought not to be something that we embrace. But there will be Christians who will be voting not because they're voting with their conscience, but because they vote with their, whether they're Democrat, Independent, or Republic, and they, Republican, and they will just vote that way without even really even thinking through the issues. Does this person represent your conscience? Now, some of you know Frank Pastore. Frank Pastore hosts KKLA, Talk from the Heart. He took over from Duffy. And most of you probably know Frank goes to our church. And so Frank and I were having lunch before he took that, that, that job. We were having a discussion concerning the recent election of, of Schwarzenegger. And we were discussing whether that was good or bad. And we were having, at the Mongolian barbecue over here in Claremont, we were eating together. And I said to him this, I said, Frank, I said, I think a lot of people voted with expedience in mind and not conscience. I believe that people thought that McClintock couldn't win, therefore they cast their vote for a Repub Republican who could, and they cast it for Schwarzenegger. And as we were discussing that, I said, the thing that concerns me is this. We need to understand that our vote is really a moral statement. When I make a vote, I am making a moral statement. I'm not voting for a party. I'm voting for a person who ideologically is closer to what I believe. Therefore, if he's a, a Democrat who is closer to the platform I adhere to in issues that I'm concerned with, I am more prone to vote for that person or an independent than though I'm a Republican, I would just as soon vote for the person who is according to what I see in a moral fashion. Because we need to understand that our vote is a moral statement. And so a lot of people don't think that way. They say, and I know this, they say, my dad was a Democrat. My mom and my dad were FDR Democrats. My mom was a Democrat, my dad was a Democrat, my grandparents have been, and I am, and I come from a long line, and so we just vote the ticket. I don't do that. 
What I vote is my conscience because I'm aware of culture wars. I'm aware of the fact that I am not to honor a vile person and that what my heart should be doing is honoring those who honor the Lord. And part of the way that I value them is I choose my heroes. I choose the people who represent the way I think closest. And I'm not saying that if he's born again that he's the best candidate. He may not be. But some people don't think that way. All I'm trying to say is the scripture is pretty clear here that if I'm going to be an upright man working righteousness, speaking truth in my heart, then one of the things I'm going to do in verse 4 is I'm, I'm going to despise, and that despise means to not value. I'm not going to value the things that a vile person represents. I'm going to honor those who fear the Lord. And I think that's a very important thing for us today because I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of Christians who didn't really have a problem with what took place this last sun, Sunday at the Super Bowl. There are a lot of people who didn't have a problem with that at all. And they named the name of Christ. And I think part of the reason is is because they're still growing in their faith to understand that they, these things here are affecting generation after generation. And what we're watching right now is we're watching a deterioration. And we're watching an envelope being pushed more and more to the point where it's acceptable even to believers. Now, continuing on here, he goes on to say in verse 4, He who swears to his own hurt and does not change, he who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. So he says, He who swears to his own hurt and doesn't change. A righteous person honors his pledges and his agreements, even when it costs him a profit. When he says, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change, it reminds me once again of what, how valuable it is to have a good reputation or a good name. In Proverbs 22, verse 1, the Bible says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Ecclesiastes 7, 1 says, a good name is better than precious ointment. A person who says, I'm going to do it and upholds that, what he said he will do, is a person of integrity. And that's what we need today. I mean, sometimes you might ask, uh, you might be looking into yellow pages. You see a little ichthus. The guy says he's a Christian. You need something to be done. You ask him to come because you like to give business to the household of faith. The guy doesn't repair the product properly. You call him up and you say, can you come and fix it? And he says, I'm sorry, can't make it. And then you discover that sometimes seers will honor their word more than a Christian does. Well, I really believe that what we need to do is it says, like he says here, he who swears to his own hurt, it simply means if he said he's going to do it, he's going to do it, even if it turns out the job costs more than he initially thought it would. He gave him a price, he's going to hold fast to that price, and he's going to do the job and learn a lesson about estimating uh, next time. When he says in verse 5, he doesn't put out his money at usury, that word usury speaks of high interest. In other words, he doesn't take advantage of the one who has financial needs. Because a righteous person is more inclined towards generous giving and helping of other people. Instead of charging high interest, they care for those who are in need. Proverbs 22, 22 says, Do not rob the poor because he's poor, nor oppress the afflicted at the gate. He says he doesn't take a bribe against the innocent. In other words, he's a just person, not influenced by people's reputations. He can't be bought. He can't take a, a bribe in order to be on the side of somebody who's guilty. That's because a righteous person cares for the needy. And when he goes on in verse 5 and concludes, he simply says, He who does these things shall never be moved. Righteousness pr produces stability in life. Convictions result in great acts and ultimately open the door to dwelling with God. If you want to go to heaven, he says, you're going to have a life that's earmarked like this. Now we get into Psalm 16, beginning at verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. And to the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. You, O Lord, are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope for you will not leave your soul in shield nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
This is a psalm filled with joy that comes through his fellowship with the Lord. And he says, in spite of the fact that he's going through hard times and tough times are occurring, still he has joy because he's going to be with the Lord. Now notice how he begins. He says, preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. Lord, I'm going through a hard time right now, but I know you're going to take care of me. And I know you'll take care of me because you are worthy of my trust. My confidence is placed in you because you love me. Psalm 9, verse 10 said, Those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Isaiah said it this way in chapter 26, verses 3 and 4, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for God the Lord is everlasting strength. So he's saying, I put my trust in you because you're trustworthy. I know that you'll take care of me in my time of need. So I ask you to preserve me. When he says in verse 2 and 3, O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are, you are my Lord, my goodness is nothing apart from you. He's simply assessing himself, and he says, I have no personal goodness within me. See, that's part of the problem today is sometimes we think we're better than we are. Sometimes we think we're doing better than we are. Now, I'm not saying that we should run around saying, oh, worm that I am, oh, wretch that I am, oh, lousy person that I am, unless you feel like it. Now, I don't think you should. We're not as good as we think we are, and most of the time we're not as bad as we feel that we are. We're somewhere in between. But I need an honest assessment of who I am. Not because I want to beat myself all the time. There are some people who are constantly down on themselves, always down about some failure. Sometimes they have to think for a long time to remember something that they did even five years ago to feel bad about. Sometimes they have a habit of worry. They want to worry all the time. I remember my mom before she got saved. My mom was a real worry wart. She was a black belt worry person. My mom worried about everything. And I remember her walking up to me and said, Honey, she says, You want to know something? She said, Since I got saved, I discovered something. I said, What's that, Mama? I discovered I don't worry anymore. I said, Really? And she said, Yeah, and I'm worried about that. <laughs> I'm serious, she really did. And I'm worried about that. No, I don't, I don't believe that any of us in this room should walk out constantly beating ourselves up, walk into the church beating yourself up. And sometimes I think that the way that I speak, some people may feel that. And forgive me if I give you that impression. That's not the truth at all. But we really need to understand what he's saying in verse 2 when he says, my goodness is nothing apart from you. No matter how good I may feel that I am, the only thing that makes me any good is the fact that you're in my life. That's what makes me what I am. My goodness is nothing apart from you. I have had to receive your goodness to make me good at all, Lord, and I'm thankful that you have given to me your righteousness. I thank you that you have cared for me. Paul in Romans 7, 18, 7, 18 said it like this. The apostle Paul said, I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, Nothing good dwells. That's all he's saying. In my nature, without you, Lord, there's no goodness in me. But he goes on in verse 3, and he says, To the saints who are on the earth, they are excellent ones in whom is all my delight. I realize that without you, I'm nothing. I also delight in the fact that I have fellowship with people who love you. Now, very briefly, but very importantly, I say this to my kids. I've said it. I, I practice this myself. Marie and I, as a couple, have practiced this one thing that I'm about to share with you right now. It's a very simple one, simple point, simple basic thing. If you want to grow in the things of the Lord, be careful who you hang around with. Because normally, under normal circumstances, you show me a person's friends, and I, I will show you that person under normal circumstances. You show me what you like to do. You show me who you like to hang around with. If you give me an opportunity to get to know your best friend, in getting to know your best friend, I'm getting to know what you're like. Because like begets like. Because we hang around with people normally who are like us. And those who are most in agreement with us, we end up being closest to. So be very careful who you allow to influence your life. Be very careful. Now, am I saying that we should be so righteous and so good that there's just nobody good enough to hang around with us? No. What I'm saying is, be aware of who you allow to influence you. You see, the psalmist is simply saying, I know that without you, I'm nothing, and I delight to be with people 
that are set apart to serve you because a combination of my knowledge of who I am and who you are in my life, a combination of that knowledge and the knowledge of how people influence me is helping me to walk with you and have a delight in you. Now, what I'm trying to say is something very simple. Choose your friends wisely because they influence you for eternity. A friend named George Adams, I got saved. He stood up with me when the invitation was given. The invitation, Arthur Blessed, the evangelist, says, uh, stand up if you want to give your heart to the Lord. I pray silently. I'm not, I'm not a Christian, but I pray silently and say something like, God, I know that I need you, but I can't stand up because I'm, I'm ashamed, I'm embarrassed to stand up in front of people. But if somebody would stand up with me, I would stand. Arthur Blessed, no, no sooner had I said, if somebody will stand up with me, I would stand. Arthur Blessed says, perhaps you're afraid to stand by yourself. If somebody would stand with you, would you stand? And my friend George taps me on the shoulder and says, I will stand with you. And I got saved that day. George, who was, was my, like an elder to me because he'd been saved for almost a year, uh, George became the guy who mentored me. And it was George who imparted to me the four basic things that I continually share with you. Now, I don't say it this way, but what I say is these four things almost every time I teach. These same four things. Get in the Word of God, pray, fellowship with godly people, and share your faith with other people. Those four things. I was a brand new Christian the day I got saved, December 27th. Those four things were poured into my heart and have been with me for 33 years. Your friends will influence you for good or for evil. Choose wisely who you allow to influence you. And ask God to give you friends who delight in Him, and you decide to be a friend like that for somebody else. And then watch what God will do in your life. And that's why he says, to the saints who are on the earth, verse 3, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lip. In other words, I'm not going to have anything to do with those who don't worship you. I'm not going to join together with them. They ultimately are going to receive judgment for those, those lives, and I want nothing to do with their false worship. Psalm 32, verse 10 says, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. In verse 5, You, O Lord, are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Now, I want you to notice that. Because he speaks in verse 5 about an inheritance, in verse 6 about an inheritance. Notice verse 6, he speaks of the lines that have fallen to me. And what he's saying in verse 5, you maintain my lot. All of this is speaking concerning the way the Jews thought concerning the blessings of God. Remember when God called the nation of Israel to, to take the promised land, there were 12 tribes. And God divided the promised land by lot to those 12 tribes. To the tribe of Levi, he gave no portion of land because he was their portion. But the others received portions of land. And what David is simply saying here is he's remembering that the Jews received as a portion of their inheritance land. And he's saying what you have really given to me is far superior than, than land on the earth. What you have become is my inheritance. In other words, like, like the Levites of old, David is simply saying, you are my inheritance. You are my portion. You are my lot. You are the one that I really want more than any physical blessings that even demonstrate your presence in my life. Because I don't want to mix up you with your promises. Because sometimes people can get caught up with the promises, listen carefully, and forget the promiser. So Abram, in the Old Testament, is, is childless. But God had appeared to him and spoken to him and said, you're going to have a son. Now his wife Sarai, seeing that she's barren, tells him, go into my handmaiden Hagar, and through her you can bring seed, and that will be as if it's mine. So we know the story. I don't have to go too deeply into that. He goes into Hagar. She has a son named Ishmael. 
But God appears to Abram and says, now this time next year, you're going to have a son. His name's going to be Isaac. And uh, Abram is absolutely blown away by that. But God fulfills that promise. And Sarah conceives in a miraculous way. She's 90 years old. He's 100. And they have this miracle child named Isaac. Now, ultimately, God speaks to Abram, and he says to him, take your son, your only son, Isaac. Now, wait a minute. You have another son named Ishmael. What are you talking about, your son, your only son? Ishmael is of the flesh. Isaac is the son of promise. He says, you take your son, your only son. You're going to go three days. There's a location I'm going to show you. You're going to take him onto this hill, and you're going to sacrifice him to me. Without any argument, without any statement, you can read it in Genesis 22. He, he, he saddles up the donkey, takes a journey. He tells the guys with him, the, the lad and I are going to go and worship. We shall come back to you. But he knows that the Lord has said, no, you're going to sacrifice your only son to me. He goes up onto the hill. His son Isaac, who's, who's a young man, could be 20-plus years of age by that time, could have easily overpowered this old man says, well, I see fire, and I, and I, and, and I, I see the wood, but um, where's the lamb for the offering? And, and Abram, looking at his son, says, God will provide himself a lamb. Now, that's a foretelling of the fact that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, will take away the sin of the world. But he takes his son, and he puts him up, takes the knife, pulls it back, and is about to slaughter his own son. And many years ago, I did a message, and I entitled that message, Sacrificing Your Isaac. And the point I tried to make in that message is the one I'm trying to make right now. He had options. He could have argued, and he could have said, you gave me a promise. And in that promise, he could have valued Isaac more than the promiser. And sometimes what we end up doing, guys, is, is we miss God in his promises and we fail to realize that, that, that to have fellowship with God and to know the Lord in a deep and personal way sometimes takes us to places that we may not be prepared to go into. Because I believe that the Lord sometimes to reveal to us what he's really like is going to shatter the illusions of what we think he's like so that that idol that we have, we have uh, placed in our mind concerning what God is like is broken so that we can see the real thing. Uh, how do I know that? Well, in, in Matthew 11, uh, we've got John the Baptist. He's, he's in prison. He hears of what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing, and, and, and his assessment of what Messiah was to do is different than what Jesus is doing. So he gets a couple of his guys, and he calls them in, and he's there ready to lose his head. And he says, I want you to go out, and I want you to interview Jesus of Nazareth and find out if he's the coming one, or should I look for another? And so these men come, and they approach Jesus, and they ask him, we have come from John. John has asked us to ask you a question. Are you the coming one? Are you Messiah? Or should we be looking for another? And then Jesus at that moment shares concerning the works that he's doing there, opening the eyes of the blind and all. And then he says, and blessed is the man who is not offended because of me. Now, what do you mean? Blessed is the man who does not try to create me into an image and put me into a little box and try and stifle me from being who I am. Blessed is the, is the man who recognizes that I am who I am and no man tells me what to do and no one can form me into their image. Blessed is the man who understands that I am God and isn't stumbled when they discover that sometimes I allow them to go into areas and to do things and to feel things that they would not have ever wanted. Like Abraham with that knife looking at his beloved son, seeing all of the promises invested in him about to be destroyed. And yet in Hebrews 11, the Bible tells us that Abraham was going to, to kill Isaac knowing that, that in a figure when he had him in the first place, he was as good as dead. 
and knowing that God who gave to him a child even when he was physically as good as dead was able to raise him from the dead. So the promiser was greater than the promise. And one of the things that we need to understand today is the Lord sometimes will allow you to go through things that you don't want to go through in order that you can see that God is with you no matter where you go and no matter how you feel and no matter what happens to you in your life. He wants to show you that he's God in every circumstance, you see. And that's how it works in the things of the Lord. And that's how it works as you grow in the things of God. And you discover that the Lord is your portion. As long as you have him, that's all you really need. In verse 7, he continues, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. I thank God because he constantly guides me. I thank God that during the day, I'm aware of his presence. And at night, I mull over his counsel. I'm aware of what the Lord has taught me, and I'm aware of what the Lord has placed in my heart. I receive with meekness his implanted word, which is able to save my soul. It's what he's saying here. Now, one other thing in verse 7, when he speaks about my heart instru uh, instructs me in the night seasons, one brief thought. Night seasons obviously means at night, but there are seasons in our lives that we go through that can be very easily described as night seasons. Seasons of darkness. I just was sharing about that with Abram. That is part of the Christian life. Don't be surprised when everything around you seems to be going wrong. Don't be surprised when you go through tough times. Because in the going through the tough times, your faith is refined and God has proven to be strong. Keep that in mind. And every one of us will go through seasons of night. We'll see that phrase over and over again as we go through the Psalms, by the way. And he, when he says in verse 8, I have set the, the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. I have full confidence in God and I have complete dependence on his strength. He will protect me. Psalm 63, 8 says, My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. The right hand in Scripture very often speaks of the power of the Lord and that's the point that he's making. When he says he's at my right hand, that's another way of saying he has made me strong and that's why I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. My glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So I know that death will not separate me from fellowship with you because I believe in resurrection and I believe in eternal reward. In Daniel, in chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So he's saying, my flesh also will rest in hope. I'm not going to just die and become food for worms. I know that something's going to happen. Verse 10, you will not leave my soul in shield, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You'll show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So God, I know that heaven is prepared for me. And I know that there is a resurrection. I know that my Redeemer lives, and I know that I will see him. So David had that hope. That's a hope that guides and strengthens us. If, if all we had in this life is, is, is what we possess in this life, then we of all people are most miserable. But we have this life, and we have heaven too. And God blesses us in this life, but also blesses us with heaven. And so that's something that he's speaking about. But beyond that, this is also something that is messianic. This is a prophecy that relates to Jesus the Messiah, because in Acts chapter 2, verses 31 and 32, uh, we read that David, foreseeing this concerning the resurrection, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. So David was saying, I know that you will raise me from the dead, but this is also prophecy relating to Jesus Christ, who died and was also raised from the dead. 
And the result was verse 11, you show me the path of life, in your presence is fullness of joy, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, you in a hurry? Let's see now. Hmm. Hmm. Psalm 17. Yeah. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer that is not from deceitful lips. Let my vindication come from your presence. Let your eyes look on the things that are upright. Now, as we notice this, this is the prayer of what has been called a righteous man. He's surrounded by people who oppose both him and God, but he's holding fast to the Lord. Notice in verses 1 and 2 how he says, um, hear, he says, attend to, he says to the Lord, give ear to me. Uh, in other words, he's saying, Lord, you are the one who will vindicate me, and I'm asking you to listen. I'm making a, a request and, and the way that he makes that request re, re, really highlights the uh, urgency of his heart. And he's pointing out to the Lord that he is a sincere man. I'm not a hypocrite, and I'm approaching you with honesty. And as he speaks to him, he says in verse 3, You have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. You've tried me and found nothing. I have purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Uphold my steps in your paths that my footsteps may not slip. In other words, I've lived according to your word, and by holding fast to your word, I have been kept from following after evil. In Proverbs 1.10, the writer said, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Ephesians 5.11, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, expose them. So he's saying, I have walked in such a way. I have kept myself from the path of the destroyer, but I'm asking you to uphold my steps that I may not slip. You know, sometimes uh, the scriptures, and we'll see this in the Psalms, speak concerning this slippery slope. And there are times that, that we might understand that you may be in the mountains and you're crossing a stream and you've got these smooth rocks and, and some of them have some of that slime on them. And you're talking to a friend and they're on the other side there and they're saying, come on across the rocks, they're okay, it's safe, just be careful. And you start to walk on those rocks and as you rock, walk on the rocks, you, your foot starts slipping out from underneath you. Well, the way of the evil one is like a slippery slope. But what the Lord is saying here through David is to remind us that you can have it strong if you follow my path properly. And that's why he says, uphold my steps in your path that my footsteps may not slip. I want to walk on solid ground. In verse 6, I have called upon you, for you hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. Show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand, O you who save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. I pray with confidence because I know that you love me. I can pray with confidence because I know that you answer prayer. And this boldness that I have simply reveals the relationship that I have with you. For you have said, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. He says in verse 9, from the wicked who oppress me, from the deadly enemies who surround me. In verse 8, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me from hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from the deadly enemies who surround me. Lord, keep me safe. Now, when he says the apple of your eye, that's the pupil. But I've shared this with you before, but this phrase here was a foreign phrase to me when I was a little boy. And so I can still remember my Uncle Louie. My Uncle Louie was from uh, Col Columbus, Georgia. He was married to my Aunt Tilly. And he had that soft southern drawl. And I can remember walking into the, into the front room. He was there visiting with my dad and my mom. And as I walked into the room, I was just a little guy at that time, maybe about six or seven years old. And he looked at me and he said, David? And I said, yes, Uncle Louie. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, you're the apple of my eye. And I got mad. <laughs> I, I thought, I really did. I went into the room and I was angry. And I sat on the bed and I folded my arms. And I was just mad as a hornet. How could you call me something like that? And my dad walks in, you know. I mean, I was not one of these kids who, if, if I was mad, you would know it. And so my dad walked in, and he sees me sitting on the bed like that, and he says, son, what's wrong with you? 
I said, why did he say that to me? He said, said, what? Why did he say I was an apple in an eye? And, and he said, <laughs> my dad said, he didn't say you're an apple in an eye. Well, what's he mean? And he said, when, when uncle says that you're the apple of his eye, it's another way of saying that he, he loves you. And so that phrase really speaks to my heart. As I was reading through and preparing this, I thought of my uncle even as I was reading this today. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from, from my deadly enemies who surround me. They have closed up their fat hearts. With their mouths they speak proudly. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They have set their eyes crouching down to the earth like a lion that is eager to tear his prey and as a young lion lurking in secret places. My enemies are trying to destroy me. They're lying about me, speaking proudly and even laying traps for me. Arise, O Lord, confront him, cast him down. Deliver my life from the wicked with your sword. With your hand from men, O Lord, from men of the world who have their portion in this life and whose valley you fill with your hidden treasure. They're satisfied with children and leave the rest of their substance for the babes. These are people, he's simply saying, who live like animals. They eat until they're satisfied, have children, leave inheritances to them, yet that's the totality of their life because they have no heavenly hope and they have no reward. But as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awaken your likeness. Lord, some people live as if there's no heaven and there's no hell. They fill their life with pleasure. They go about as if they'll never die. They even leave inheritances for their kids. But as for me, nothing on the face of this earth will ever satisfy me completely. Because the only thing that I long for, this one thing, is that I might be with you. That I might see your face in righteousness. So one day... One day, and it's not that long, by the way, from now, one day, you're going to have the opportunity, you're going to have the opportunity to see Jesus face to face. It's not that long from now. One day, you're going to be able to look into the eyes of the one who wept for you. You're going to be able to see the man who carried a cross for you. You're going to be able to be with the one who changed your life. Sometimes in messages you can hear, we need to do this and we ought not to do that, and those are all good things. But let me close with one last thought, and that is this. What is the motivation for me doing or not doing certain things? The motivation isn't so that I can look good to people. The motivation isn't even that I might have a happy or successful life. Because by just taking the Word of God and practicing it, you can actually have a great life, just period. You could have a great life if you live just uh, according to what the Word says. Even if there were no God, if you lived like this, you'd still live a great life. You could live a good life that way. But... There's a motivation. What's the motivation? Well, the motivation is simple, just to see Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind. To awaken in his likeness. One day, you're going to have an opportunity, and I hope that this is something that you keep refreshing your mind with and your heart with. This is the thing that keeps me going, and let me share it with you. One day, you're going to have an opportunity to walk up to Jesus Christ. To Jesus Christ. And to look right into his eyes. You're going to have the opportunity to reach out and take him by the hand. You're going to have an opportunity to embrace him. You're going to have an opportunity to experience him in a way that you can't possibly now because because he's not here physically with you. But in heaven, you're going to have that opportunity. Now, I've had friends who have said, boy, you know, when I get to heaven, I want to talk to the Apostle Paul. And I always say, go for it. Because if you talk to Paul, that's one less person in line to be with Jesus. Because for me, I want to hang with Jesus. I don't know about you, but I do. I want to hang around with Jesus Christ. So what I'm doing right now is, is I'm practicing that. I, I walk with him now. I pray to him now. I fellowship with him now. 
I read his word now. I'm getting to know him now because I want to know as much about him as I can because now I only know in part, but then I will know even as I am known. It's like a bride who doesn't yet know her husband. She's engaged. She knows a lot about him. She's got to know him through the engagement. But when they marry, now she lives with, learns his ways, and gets to know him. The church is the bride of Christ. We spend time with the Lord in prayer, in his word, in fellowship with those who love him. But one day, we see him face to face. And that's what's going to satisfy you ultimately. So my encouragement to you is to seek him every day with all of your heart and prepare yourself to meet him because it's not that far from now that you'll see the one who loved you and gave himself.